we go. <clears throat> and check how much space I have on my hard drive. Make sure I get enough space to. Yep, well, I think we got enough. All right, it is 31. I'll, I'll wait another minute before getting started. So if you cannot get this program to work, you know, in the end, it's the point value is not that much. Okay, you know, so that's one kind of kind of keep that you know perspective. But as you go through the exercise to try to get it to work, that is studying. Um, you know, the, the point value is kind of insignificant you know by comparison going through the exercise is studying so when I give you the solution today you know then you know things should start to click really well so that's kind of the uh, the purpose of these homework assignments and also getting a uh, spider up and running you know as early as possible is going to be a help although with this particular program you can run it inside Logisim to see whether it works or not. Um, there are certain techniques they can do to get, get it to work that way. All right, so let me take a look at the clock. It is 32, I'll give you know, another 30 seconds or so and then I'll start off with the lecture. <clears throat> It's already recording, okay? So I you know, just want to make a point that it is already recording <clears throat> because I think today's lecture may be helpful. You know, it's kind of no more, I mean, we are gonna reuse a lot of the material that we have already been, we have already introduced. It's just that you know, when you start to try to get the work done, you know, try to program you know, with a TTP ASM, you know, the experience is a little different from watching me doing it. Just like all the infomercials. All right, so I think I'm gonna get started. You know, people who come a little bit late can probably just kind of watch the video from the beginning. Okay, so this is your homework assignment, you know, which is you're starting with the code that is providing provided to you, your only uh, responsibility is to implement swap itself. So it, not, not counting the function definition and so on, there are three lines to implement. But those three lines you know, really require you to fully understand what is on the stack, what are local variables, how things are located on the stack, and also you know, you know, what, is, what are we doing on the right hand side? What are we doing on the left hand side? How do we use all the instructions that we have talked about so far to implement all of those things? So it is still a good exercise to see how much you understand about the material that has been, that has been introduced already. In other words, this program does not involve any new concepts that we have not talked about. It is basically a combination of those things. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the C code. The most important part of the C code is we are taking, we are not storing pointer one into T. We are storing whatever pointer one is pointing to, to T. That is kind of important. Um, I don't know how many people watched the video that I prepared um, over the weekend because I kind of emphasized that portion. Okay, you know, I ran the program in GDB to illustrate that, okay, PT pointer one is really the address of x in main. Pointer two is really the address of y in main. So the moment you do any changes to whatever pointer one is pointing to, it changes local variable x of main. Every time you change your whatever pointer two is pointing to, you are changing directly local variable y of main. 
So those are all important things. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and implement this program. So I am going to implement swap first, and then we'll go ahead and kind of trace the code. Okay. So here, this is all we need to copy from. And then <clears throat> this is a, uh, I'll just copy it to here. Uh, Swap.ttpsm, paste, there we go. All right. So you have a few choices of how to get started with this program. Main is done already. And that's also why in the lab, I said, okay, put a halt instruction right at swap and so that you can actually see what is on the stack. Okay, you can look at the stack pointer. You can also look at that portion of memory and find out, oh, what did we just push on the stack? Where exactly is X? Where exactly is Y? That is, that's the job of that particular lab activity is for you to take a look at what memory looks like at the time at the entry point of swap. So we know that swap has one local variable. So if I want to do things the more systematic way, which is preferred, <clears throat> I would define an offset to t first, which is zero, because that's the one and only local variable. It is sitting at the bottom of the stack, or I should say it's the most recent item that we allocate on the stack. And that's why the offset from where the stack pointer points to, to, to local variable t, would be zero, because that's exactly where it is. Um, and then swap LVS, local variable size, is swap underscore t1 plus. So it is basically because t is the only local variable. So if we know where to find t and just add the size of t, that should give us the total number of bytes that we need to allocate for all the local variables. <clears throat> and then we get to the parameters. So it has two parameters. It has pointer one as a parameter. That would be swap LVS one plus. Okay, because you know, um, we have that one extra thing called the return address, which is sitting between, it's sandwiched between the parameters and also the local variables. And then finally, we have pointer two, which is the you know, one byte after pointer one, because it is the second parameter, which is pushed first by the caller, so it has the highest address. Are we doing okay so far with the label definition? Because the label definitions are really important, because you know, if you see this and go like, okay, I. I get it, okay, I understand why you know, things are the way they are you know, defined. That means you're pretty much you're understanding you know, how things are you know, used on the stack. I'm going to note here, um, okay, so we can, okay, I'll just you know, kind of put it into the last portion. Okay, because what I want to do is to show you what it looks like on the stack. All right, so I'll give it a All right, so we got locations, okay? This is what you should do when you try to write this code, is to, to figure out what is at each location. So what is at location FF and location FE for this code? Hmm? Y and X, okay? So which one is Y? FF is Y, okay? and this is X, and both of these are for main, okay? And then we have FD, FC, FB. They're all used for calling swap. So when we call swap, FD, FC are the parameters, and then FB is the return address. This is our return address. So FD is the address of Y, so it would have FF in it. FC, on the other hand, is the address of X, so at that location we have FE in it. Are we doing okay so far? So at the entry point of swap, the pointer, the stack pointer is pointing here, and this is you know, what, the, what the lab, or you know, what the interactive lab, the quiz, is trying to tell you is, okay, this is the picture that we, we should be looking at, but then swap has a local variable, so local variable t of swap 
is going to be at location FA. So that means the stack pointer has to be changed so that it points to here before we can do anything because we have to allocate the space for the local variable first before we can actually implement the statements inside the C program, or inside the C function. So are we still doing okay so far with this picture? Okay, very good. <clears throat> so when you look at the offsets, so this is D plus zero, and that's why swap underscore T is defined to be zero. It takes up one byte. So when you look at um, pointer one, the label for pointer one actually essentially boils down, boils down to a two, and then the, uh, the label for pointer two basically boils down to a three because it is three bytes away from where the stack pointer points to, which is right here. Is that okay? So having this picture in your mind or on a piece of paper is actually quite useful here when you are debugging the program. All right, so that's where we that's what we have here. And then going back to the program, okay? So the first thing I do personally, I just do the allocation, do the deallocation of local variables. There's only one here, and then do the return. Okay, so that's usually what I do. So that goes with uh, LDI A with swap LDS, and then subtraction from the stack pointer is allocation. So now I just do a copy of these two lines, change the subtract to an add in order to deallocate the local variable, and now I'm ready for return. So the return is LD B D increment D J M P B. Okay. So right now I have the skeleton of swap. It doesn't do a single thing, but at the same time, it should return without crashing. Um, the stack should remain balanced when I get back to the main uh, fun function. And the main is already done, okay? So it would do the deallocation of the local variables, excuse me, the arguments, and then the local variables of main. So that's what I would do, okay? I would just write a program like this, and then run it through Logisim, I mean, uh, run it through um, River Spider, but you can also run it through just you know, the, uh, the simulator as well, you know, because you, know, you can see in the simulator that it doesn't crash, it ends up on the halt instruction that it's supposed to end up at, and then the stack pointer is back to zero, zero. You can still verify all of those things in Logisim itself without using uh, River Spider. But River Spider is particularly useful because that's what it's built for, is to um, help debug programs like this. So we'll go ahead and try to debug. Uh, where did I put the program? Um, PWD. Oh, I stash it inside River Spider itself. So it is just right here. So swap.ttpasm, run the code. <clears throat> now I have to go find the assembler okay. Oops. now some people may be able to uh, do this homework assignment without you know doing it in smaller steps but that would not be recommended all right here so here's the assembler I just want to make sure that I fully understand what the code is doing. This is storing a three to X, and then this is storing a, a seven to the Y. This is pushing the address of Y as PTR2. This is pushing the address of X as PTR1. This is pushing the return address of one seven. Then, uh, then we get into the subroutine, you know, which basically just allocates the stack pointer you know, to allocate for the local variable. So the stack pointer went from FB to FA, which means the location FA is now available as a local variable for T, but I'm not even using it, okay, because I return right away. <clears throat> so I just observe the code, you know, watch it return, okay, this is the return, the last instruction of the return code. It returns to the increment instructions of main. And then at the very end, we get D or the stack pointer back to zero, zero, and the halt instruction is here. So at this point, I know that I have the skeleton 
of swap already done. And because without even knowing that, I'm not going to write a single line of code because I don't even know whether the stack is set up correctly. I know where to find what and so on. All right. So knowing that, now I can go back to the source code and you know make some additional changes. In fact, you know if I were using you know GitHub um, or any type of repository, I would check it in right away. Okay, I would check it in as the first version, which and then comment and say that okay, the skeleton of the function is done correctly. I just verified it. Okay, because it gives me a point to fall back on in case something bad goes on, you know, happens, and you know, then I know I can fall back onto this one. Okay. So now the first line, okay, I'm going to put the line here. T gets whatever PTR1 is pointing to. So how do we do this? The first part is to deal with the right-hand side. Now, you don't have to deal with the right-hand side first, okay? It's just convention uh, that I would deal with the right-hand side first. So the right-hand side is we need to get to what pointer 1 is pointing to. So how do we get there? Okay, just analyze the statement. I need to get to whatever point of one is pointing to. Yep. So we need to get to point of one first, right? Point of one itself stores the address of what I need. Okay, so we need to get to point of one first. Yes? Yep. So we need an LDI first, right? LDI. And right now, because this function does not have a fun has a return statement, so I really have you know, registers A, B, and C available to me all the way to the end. Even if the function has a return statement that returns a value, a scalar, I still have registers A, B, C available to, available to me all the way until the return statement. So you know, we basically have three registers to use um, all the time when we're implementing statements in the function. So I get the offset first, okay, swap PTR1. This is the offset to get to um, PTR1. This will get me the address of PTR1. This will give me the value of PTR1, which is great. But that is not what I really want on the right-hand side because what I have right now is the same as this. So I need a extra dereference. There are only two instructions that can do dereferencing because you know, the, if the operand looks like open paren something, close paren, it is dereferencing. There are only two instructions that can do that. One is load and one is store. One is reading from memory and the other one is storing to memory. So in this case, it's the right-hand side of the uh, assignment, so I just need to read. So I need one extra LDAA over here. So the register A is now whatever point of one is pointing to. And then on the other side, I gonna uh, I need to store that to T. So that means you know, LDI B. I cannot reuse register A in this case because I need it back later on. So this is the offset. This is the address. Once I have the address of the entire left hand side, I can now store to that address. So the left-hand side is different from the right-hand side in the sense that what you really need to get to is the address of where you need to store on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, on the other hand, you need to get to the value of whatever the right-hand side is expressing. So from that perspective, the left-hand side and the right-hand side are slightly different because the last part are a little bit different. Okay. So with these instructions, I should store whatever point of one, which is the address of X is pointing to. So that should be, I cannot remember whether it was a three or a seven. Okay. So initialize X, X starts with three. So that means you know, with these instructions, I should be storing a three to location F A. Okay. Because location FA, we figured that out a little bit earlier in the diagram. So this is location FA. It is my local variable T. And uh, PTR1 is pointing to location FE. Location FE is was initialized to 3. So that means I should store a 3 to location FA with this much code. 
Now, I can, can I write more code before testing? The answer is yes, I can, but it is not a good idea. So I would just run the code first and make sure that it runs. So right now, you know, what I'm testing is something that you can also do in just LogiSim. So if you cannot get River Spider running, you can still test this much code because you can still go to the RAM, you'll go to the editor of RAM, go to location FA, and see if a, a value of three is there or not. Okay, so there, so we already know we can still test the program and debug the program without River Spider. Now with River Spider, it is obviously a little bit faster and more effective, <clears throat> but technically speaking, it is not even 100% needed. So we can see right here, we are storing a value of three to location FA, so that part is done, okay? Now this is really important. I know I'm, I've only done, like I've only completed one of the three statements in C, but this tells me that I know how to get to the dereference of pointer one. I know how to store, Everything seems to work the way they're supposed to be, which also means that I understand how things are arranged on the stack. So that's, that's, this is actually important. So now I can go back to the code and implement the next statement. So the next statement is taking whatever pointer two is pointing to and then store to you know, wherever pointer one is pointing to, okay? I will put the comment here so it's easier for you guys to read it. I will share this file with all of you when this is all done so that you can add the comments. All right, so we once again, you know, we get to the right-hand side first. Once again, it is not necessary to do it that way, but you know, most people do it this way because we technically have to find out what value we are storing before we find out where to store the value. So there we go, add AD. Uh, LDAA, -A -A, LD -A -A. that's the right-hand side. The left-hand side is very similar, except for one little thing at the end, okay? So we have add BD, LD, B, B, and then we have a ST, B, A. That's the only difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. We still need the extra load here, because otherwise, we just have the address of the parameter. I need the parameter itself because ultimately I need to access what the parameter itself is pointing to, okay? So now I think I have completed the second you know, statement in the C code, so I'm going to test it. So to test this, I just have to rerun, you know, swap. But from the perspective of the diagram, I also want to know what is going to happen here. Because I am taking whatever pointer to, which is pointing to Y, I need to get whatever is at location FF, which is a seven right now, and store that to whatever pointer one is pointing to, which is, lo which is uh, changing location FE. So I'm expecting location FE to store a zero seven with this particular step. Okay, but that's what I'm expecting to happen. If I make a mistake, it's not gonna happen. So that means you know, I can now go back to the trace and see whether that is happening. And it is not happening. There can be several common uh, reasons. One is I did not save the file. <laughs> okay, that's probably what happened. Typical, Typical yeah. The thing is not about you know, whether you make mistakes or not. The question is, do you know your favorite mistakes? Because, because if you do, debugging you know, is usually not too difficult if you already know, yeah, I tend to make this kind of mistake. <clears throat> Everybody has some favorite you know, mistakes to make. You know, mine is forgetting to save the file, which doesn't happen you know, when you're using you know, um, fancy GUI tools. There we go, okay, so that, that works. So we only have one more statement to do, and that last one is kind of a weird combination of the previous two, okay? So the only last, the statement we have left here is um, we want whatever PTR point to to get whatever PT has, okay? So, you know, that, so we have a LD, A, swap, T, Oops. I like the syntax highlighting, you know, because it, 
it just highlights and go like, this doesn't make sense to me. Now the assembler actually understands syntax in a slightly different way. So sometimes it will flag me here, but it is actually legitimate. Um, but you know, if it flags here, it is not gonna assemble. Well, okay, I just said it. it. It would give me a false positive. So, but it's good to fix it so that it doesn't flag me here. <clears throat> Add AD, get to the address, and do a LDAA so that I get to the actual value of local variable T. And then on the other side, you can see that, oh, can you just copy line 57 to line 60 and just change your PTR1 to PTR2? The answer is yes, absolutely, because it has exactly the same structure as that portion of the program, but I'm just gonna rewrite the whole thing, um, LDBB. This will give me pointer two. This will store to whatever pointer two is pointing to. Okay, so that's also the essential part. So store, okay, see, this save it this time. And then come here, run the code again. But every single one of these steps can also be verified just by running it in Logisim. The traverse program, on the other hand, is a little bit harder to verify. You can still kind of do it that way, but it's hard, much harder to see whether your code is doing it correctly or not. So if you're having problem getting um, Rifle Spider to work, you know, you know, you need to contact me so that you can get it working. All right, so let's switch back to the assembler, okay? But before we do that, we just want to kind of go back to um, the diagram here and try to understand, okay, this time what's gonna happen? Well, we know that T, which is location FA, has a value of zero, three from before. This time we are expecting that value to be overwriting the location that pointer two is pointing to. So pointer two is pointing to location FF. So we are expecting location FF, which currently has a value of 07 to become 03. That is what I'm expecting the program to do. And we go to the trace and find, try to find out whether that is what's happening. So this is from before. And sure enough, now we have location FF to store a value of three, so the program is all done. Do we have any questions about the swap function? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use the other approach too. Um, because you know, as long as the caller callee agreement is honored, you can do whatever you need to do to implement the code. So the function doesn't have to be implemented in a particular way. As long as the agreement is honored, you, you can do it in whatever way you want to. So there are more painful ways to do it. Yes? No, the reference works the same way when it is erroneous or extra. So you'll be dereferencing something that you should not be dereferencing. So for, for instance, if I dereference one more time, you know, when a register is three already, so in this case, B is already three. So if I try another dereference, it will go to location three, which is a part of the program opcode and grab that byte and put it into register B. In other words, it doesn't know what is right and what is wrong, okay? It doesn't understand the context it, because it doesn't know the C code. So it would just tell whatever, it would just do whatever you tell it to do. If you have an LD, B, comma, in parentheses, in parentheses B, it will just exercise inside the processor. It will just exercise all of those circuitry that we talked about weeks ago. It will use register B and, and connect it to RAM.A so that you know, register B you know, becomes the address of where you're accessing, but then in return, it will also grab whatever RAM D is and then circle it around to register in of the register bank and then update register B with the content at that location the register B is pointing to. It would just blindly do that. So the, an extra load 
In this case, we just grab whatever is at location 0, 3, which is kind of probably a part of the opcode of something, the entry code. Yep. Any other questions? Go back to the source code. Uh, there we go. Any particular question? No questions? Are we okay here? All right. So I will you know, uh, send this file to all of you by announcement. So this way, you guys will have the solution to that particular homework assignment. And you know, once you get it, what are you going to do? Comment it, okay? And um, yep, yep, commenting in your own words is going to be helpful. Um, running it through uh, Reaper Spider, getting the trace and comment the trace also is also helpful. Uh, with this program, it doesn't matter, okay? With this program, if you just kind of comment after each line, it'll be fine because the trace would also display that particular line. So when you look at the trace, you can actually follow what the program is trying to do. If you're dealing with a program that has conditional statements or loops, you know, that kind of stuff, then reading the source code is not the same as reading the trace because the trace can repeat the loop several times or take a different branch you know, every time it is there. So you have to read the trace and comment the trace differently compared to the source code. So are we good with this particular program? All right. <clears throat> so with that done, I have set up a few things, okay, because we can either talk about the final exam from last semester or, you know, I intend, I originally intended to also talk about recursion a little bit. So it's up to you. Do you guys want to talk about recursion or do you want to start talking about the final exam? Recursion? Okay. Um, sorry? Yep. For one simple reason. Simple. Very simple reason. Because recursion is nothing special. There's nothing new that we need to learn about recursion. Now, some people may complain and go like, oh, but recursion is a hard concept. Well, it is a hard concept if you need to derive a recursive algorithm. That is a little bit difficult, okay? I don't expect everybody in CISP 360 to be able to do that in a competent way, okay? Just because you know, it's a different way of thinking. But in the final exam, I'm giving you the C code. I'm giving you the faulty assembly code. Your job is to figure out what is wrong with the assembly code. And you don't even have a chance to run it, so I cannot even expect you guys to go like, yeah, I know what this code is supposed to do in the end, okay? Nope, nope, you cannot even run it. You cannot even run the C code. So it really has to do with, you look at each statement in C, and then you ask the question, is it implemented correctly in assembly? The C code may actually be wrong, okay? Maybe it would just do some funky stuff that is wrong. The question is not about the correctness of the C code. The question is the consistency between the C code and the assembly code. So that's what we are focusing on. But from that perspective, recursion is nothing special because the caller callee agreement stays exactly the same when the caller is also the callee, okay? So I'm going to illustrate it with a kind of strange little program. So the program that I'm going to use to illustrate you know, recursion is, I think I put it uh, here already. It's called square. Okay? It's a very funky way to do square. So there's a square.c and then square.ttpasm, which is not written yet. Okay? So this is the C code. It is a recursive way to find the square of n. And how, can, how do we know this is a recursive function? How do we know that square is a recursive function? It calls itself, very good, okay. Um, 
Okay, so let's go ahead and implement you know, this rather odd looking you know, square you know, thing. But before we do that, I think it helps to understand that, you know, whether it works or not, right? So we'll go ahead and take a look at square. So I'm gonna compile square so that we can actually see it working. Um, so we'll do a GDB square and it will put a breakpoint on line 11 and we'll also do a, put a breakpoint on line five, okay? Because you know, I want to know how many times uh, the function keeps calling itself. So now I do a run. This is the first time we hit a breakpoint, which is still in main. We single step. This is technically the second you know, breakpoint. And we can see the first invocation of square, n equals to five. And according to the statement here, I do it, you know, I try to turn off the syntax highlighting, you know, but it's not always you know, working. This is n question mark, and then do the recursive call, colon zero. So n by itself is used as a condition. In C and C++, that means you know, we are asking, is n not equal to zero? Okay, well, n is five, what do you think? It is. It does not equal to zero, which means it is true. So if it is true, then we execute whatever is between the question mark and the colon. I'll read it out. Square, open paren, n minus one, close paren, plus n, plus n, minus one. Okay, so there's no multiplication involved. I can compute square without multiplication. Okay, so if I single step, okay, if I continue execution, this is the second call of square, which is called from itself, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. Uh, do you think it will do another recursive call, or are we at the end of the chain of recursive calls? N is one right now. It will do one more, very good. So continue, this is one more. So this looks kind of confusing because some people may look at this and go like, oh, so we got a loop here. Well, it gets the same thing done as a loop, but it is not a loop. Because a loop stays in the same invocation of a function, this actually creates you know, many invocations of square. In fact, there are six invocations of square right now on the stack. Can some, does everybody understand the difference between the definition of a function as opposed to the invocation of a function? Okay, what, what is the difference? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the definition is what you see in the source file. It describes how things are supposed to be done. An invocation is following the, an instance of following the instruction and doing things, okay? So that means if a function is recursive, it can call itself. It is still one single function definition, but it can end up with multiple invocations stacked on top of each other, okay? So the best way to visualize the stacking is backtrace. Because in backtrace, we can actually see that, okay, main cos square, Square 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 cos square. So how many invocations of square do we have here? Six of them, exactly. Because n starts with a five, four, three, two, one, finally the zero. The zero is the last one because you know, when uh, n is zero, we simply just return a zero. Now what GDB is not very good at is showing you what, what value is being returned. So if I single step here, it just goes like, oh, we're at the end, we're at the end, 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 and now we should be back in main, okay? So we can do a BT, we are, oh, we're second to the, we are at the very last square, now we're back to main. So now I can say, okay, what is the value of X? It is 25, which is five squared. Now, exactly how this awkward recursive function you know, computes the square is a topic that we talk about in CISP 440, which is a discrete structure. Um, you know, when we talk about inductive proofs and recursive algorithms, this is one of the ones that I use. But once again, you know, this is not CISP 440, and I'm not expecting you guys to understand how the math works out, okay? Mm -hmm. We just know that hmm, for some strange reason, it does work out. Our main concern is how do we implement the same thing in assembly language? 
So we'll go ahead and implement this in assembly. So I'm going to use the new standard, which is you know, have an entry uh, level code, entry code to call main. So I'm treating main as if it is just a regular function. So uh, LDI um, D with a zero, initialize the stack pointer in quotes, uh, load A with uh, dot six plus, which is the return address, push it on the stack, and then JMP I to main when it returns, there's nothing else to do, put a halt. All right, so the first function I want to implement is square. And you know, just as usual, I want to know what is on the stack. There's the return address, but before the re above the return address is my local, var not local variable, it's the parameter n because it's pushed by the caller. I do not have any local variables in this case. Now, that doesn't stop me from doing this, okay? I can still say, mm, we don't have anything here. So, uh, but then I still have to access n, which is sqr lvs one plus. There's always this one plus. This one right here has to do with the return address taking up a byte on the stack. That is why we have that one here. Because otherwise, we just compute all the, uh, how many bytes are used by the local variables, and then the parameter will be right after that. But nope, nope, the return address is sandwiched between those two things. So that's why we have these definitions. So just like you know, the other program, I'm gonna do the unnecessary, but it looks like you know, it's, it makes things easier to deal with. So we'll go ahead and do a LDI. This time I could do a B, um, SQR LVS. Um, subtract that much from the stack corner to allocate. And then we add back to deallocate. And then we have LD, B, D, increment D, JMP, B. Okay, so I got you know the shell of the function already written. Now we can go in and try to implement the only expression on line five. Okay, so all the logic of this entire program is on line five here, which is the um, ternary expression. Okay, so it would appear to me that I need n to get anything done, right? Because the first thing I need to do is to evaluate the condition of the ternary expression, which is simply asking, is n not zero? Okay, that's what it's uh, trying to ask. So now I need the uh, LDI, I can use register A, okay? So register A with um, square, underscore n, that's the offset. Now we have the address. Now we have the value of parameter n. So once we have that, I'm going to do this trick here using the and AA to force the value of a through the ALU and therefore affecting the sign flag and also the z flag. Because all I really need to do is to see whether n is zero or not. Okay, so this is the quickest way to do it. JZI to uh, just go ahead and return a zero, okay? So JZI to, um, I'll give you the forward reference, okay? Uh, we'll just say you know, square return, which is right here. Square return is here. And now, you know, at this point, spot here, um, if I continue to write my program on line 27 at this point, that is corresponding to what if n is not zero? Does that make sense? Okay, so we now have to go like, oh, okay, that's a lot of work. Well, not really, okay? It's not really a lot of work. So we, what we need to do is to call square with n minus one, okay? So if anyone is thinking, oh man, this is a recursive call, it's gonna be difficult. Nope, because what I said earlier was the caller callee agreement does not change when a function is calling itself. It makes no difference whether main is calling square or square is calling square. It is the same convention, which means I have to push all the arguments, I have to push the return address, and then when it returns, I have to clean up all the arguments that are still sitting on the stack from the caller's perspective. Is that okay? All right? So if not for anything else, I'm hoping that this class will help demystify the mystery of recursive calls, because you know, it is a very difficult concept to understand when you are writing code in C and C++, because they don't expose how things are stored. 
There's no concept of stack unless your professor you know, mentions that. Um, using GDB helps to illustrate the concept of you know, uh, recursive call, but you know, from most, what most people told me, CISP 360 does not get much into GDB or any kind of debugging. So that means you have no way to actually see or visualize how things you know, work out in a recursive call. But in this class, everything is exposed. Okay? There's, there's no hidden stuff in this class. Even the assembler itself is open sourced. So, all right, so getting back to our program here. So I'm gonna decrement A because A has N in it. We have to decrement it first before we call. So decrement and then we push it on the stack because it is now the argument. Then we um, do the usual call thing, which is LDIA with uh, dot six plus. Okay, that's our return address. Um, decrement D and then STDA again to push the return address. JMPI to the function that we're calling, which so happens to be the same function that I'm in. Okay, but it changes nothing about the call, call caller callee agreement. When it comes back, I need to increment D because I still have um, the argument sitting on the stack. And now I can expect the square of N minus one to be in register A. Because guess what? That is the caller callee agreement. I can expect the same thing even when it is a recursive call. Are we good so far? Okay. But at the same time, I have lost track of what N is for this particular invocation of square because the callee call the caller callee agreement also says I cannot assume any registers to be preserved by the callee. In other words, if I put anything into registers A, B, or C, it I have to assume it is gone by now. Okay? So that means uh, okay, we just have to get back to N again. So I've got to do L D B um, square of oh, L D I B um, SQR uh, N, add BD, same kind of instruction that we saw earlier. We have to do it again simply because I can, you know, the callee does not preserve anything, okay? So we have to recompute it. So at this point on line 37, B now has N in it for this particular invocation. So let's see what is gonna, going on here. We have uh, register A being the return value of the square of N minus one, and then we have N itself in register B. I think the rest should be fairly easy, right? Because all I can do now, all I need to do now is to say, let's add B to A, let's add B to A, and then we'll decrement A in order to get the expression done. Are we, good? Are we okay with this code? Yes. Okay. B has the offset to B to N. B has the address to N. B is N. Register A after the function call has the return value of square of the square of N minus one. So I'm adding N to that. I'm adding N to that again because in the C code, I need to add N twice. But then we also have a minus one at the end, so we decrement A to kind of finish up the, the with the minus one, okay? So with that, we are done with this code, and then you go like, okay, but what about returning a zero? Aren't we supposed to be loading a zero into register A to return it or do a sub AA because it would do the same thing? Well, the answer is, well, I can optimize that code out. In other words, in most other cases, yes, I would need to jump around some code that puts a zero into register A, but in this case, I don't have to. Why not? Because register A would have been a zero if I skipped all of this code to get to return the square return. Why? Well, let's take a look. The only way I would skip this entire chunk of code from line 27 to line 40 is I took the JZI. The only way the JZI instruction would actually do the branch is the AND instruction sets the Z flag. And the only way the 
and instruction is going to set the Z code or the Z flag is A being zero. So that means if I skip at this point all the way to, re to square return, A is already known to be zero. Now, that's a little trick, right? It only works in this case because, you know, it just so happens that you know, zero is the correct return value for the else case, okay? So this is not the kind of thing that you can do all the time because technically speaking, that statement is an if then else. So you kind of need the same control structure of an if then else. But in this case, I can kind of shortcut it a little bit because you know, the only condition to get to the else branch is when register A is a zero already. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are many types of diff, uh, optimizations. Uh, this particular one does require the analysis of the code itself um, to figure out. You can actually do a people optimization in this case. You know, it's actually a real word, real technical word here. It's called a peephole optimization technique. So the compiler will look at certain combinations of instructions in a certain structure and go like, oh, that entire pattern can now be simplified to this pattern here with no change of the semantics or the meaning of the code. So compilers can do this type of optimization as well. All right, so I just did something that I told you guys not to do. What is it? I just wrote a bunch of, uh, I, I just wrote many lines of code without testing it first. So the hope is I'm making a mistake somewhere so I can actually show you guys how to use uh, the trace to debug the program. So we'll see. Uh, okay, so let me go here, make sure it is saved. Yep, not saved yet. Control G in VI would actually show you a lot of information about the current quote, 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 quote buffer. So right here it says modified, which means it's not saved. In fact, it says new, which means the file does not even exist right now. If I were to do a dot slash submit thing, it would just complain and say file does not exist. Okay, so this is really kind of cool as a feature. So let's go ahead and save it first. There we go. All right, so now we want to get back to River Spider, submit, uh, this is what? Square, there we go. So we'll see. The trace of this particular program is actually in, you know, kind of useful to take a look at. All right, so I have a syntax error somewhere. The source code did not assemble correctly. Ha, huh. okay. All right, let's fix that first. So to fix the source code, you go to the source tab and it says, un oh, because I haven't written main yet. Okay, fine. Minor issue, just missing one entire function. <laughs> yes, the main one too. <laughs> All right, so main has a local variable x. You know, it has an offset of zero. LVS is going to be main x one plus. Um, it has no parameters, so we are done with all the label definitions. And then we're just going to do the same thing, which is LDI B uh, main LVS subtract that much from the stack pointer. And then do the opposite at the end. And then do LDBD increment D, JMPB. Okay. So we are now back to the main portion of main. Um, X is the square of five. Okay, so we push five first. So decrement D, STDA. That's the only argument. We push the return address next. And then we do a jump to SQR. When it comes back, we have one extra byte on the stack. That is the argument. We increment D to deallocate that one extra byte. And then we store register A to X. Okay, so we have LDIB main X, uh, add BD, STBA. So that should do it. Okay. 
But before we run this code, how do we know this code is running correctly? So that means you know, we have to look at the mapping or the memory map again, because we want to be able to tell what is supposed to be at each location as we run this program. So we're gonna do about the same thing as last time, okay? I'll start a new page so there's no confusion between the two programs, okay? So with this one, location FF is the return address <clears throat> to the entry code. <clears throat> so that's that what that location is gonna be used for. Location FE is going to be a local variable X of main. So that means this is the call frame of main. The call frame is providing the context for a function to operate. And that includes the return address, all the parameters, and all the local variables. So that means location FE to FF, in this case, provides the call frame of main. And then we call um, square the first time. So when we call square the first time, that's using location FD as parameter N. And then we use location FC as the return address to main. Okay. And once we get into the function, then it's going to do the whole thing again because we know that this happens how many times again? Six times. That's right. So that means your location FD, FA is another call frame. So this is one call frame of square. Oops. There we go. This is another call frame of square. And then F9 to F8, same thing. F7, F6, same thing. So now we have four. So now we have F5 to F, F5, F4 is the fifth one. And then finally we get to F3, F2. That's the last one, okay? So when we look at this, we go like, okay, but can we tell what is gonna be at these locations? Well, it turns out we sort of can, okay? Because we know the first n is five, right? So this is five, zero five at that location. This is also n, you know, but it's for the second invocation. It should be a zero four, zero three, zero two, zero one, finally zero zero. So this way we, I can check, okay, by looking at the trace and how memory is overwritten I can kind of check whether things are done correctly or not. The return address, these should all be the same. Okay, so when I look at these locations, they should all have the same return address because all of these are returning back to square itself. There's only one point in square that I call square again. So there's only one return address back to square itself. So all of these locations that I have marked here should be the same location. Okay. All right, so we are going to run this in uh, Ripple Spider and see whether it is consistent with our anticipation here. All right, so we get to the trace. Where is it? Right here. Oh, right. I have to, I have to run it first, don't I? Okay, save. And go back here and run it again. There we go. <clears throat> This program is gonna take a little bit longer, you know, in terms of the trace, but it's an interesting one to look at. All right, so we go back to the analysis tab and we go from the beginning. Uh, this is the return address back to the entry code. Okay, we have seen this quite a few times already. And then this is five. This is the return address to main. And then we should see a four. And then this is the return address to square itself, okay? Now, how do we know that? You can always go to the assemble tab 
and go to that location, which I think is 1D. So we basically will go down to location 1D and ask, is that a return location? The answer is, yep, it is a return location because it is right after a JMPI instruction. If it is not a return location, how can you possibly get to the location that is right after a JMPI? Because JMPI is unconditional. It is always going, always going to branch. So without some mechanism to go to this particular location, that location is useless. Okay, There's no way to get back to continue execution here unless, in this case, we have a call return type of you know, situation. So are we doing OK so far with the analysis? OK. So we go back to the analysis tab, and then we, we say we should see the same re return address used multiple times. So the next one is a 3, okay, and then the same return address, which is 1D. And then this keeps going until we push 0. Okay. All right, so we push a 0, and then we push the return address. So now we, it is a good time to double check with our uh, tablet. Yep, according to this, your F2 is the last location, and it should, it should contain the return address back to square which is exactly what we are seeing here, okay? This, to me, is studying, okay? Understanding the runtime behavior of the program and be able to understand it's like, yep, I know why this byte is overwriting that location, okay? That is studying. It's understanding how the C code and the assembly code also correspond to each other. So now, at this point, we focus our attention to register A because it is the return value. So we, the first time it should return a zero, which is this one. And then we, oh, I take it back. It's just testing right now. And then we get to the actual return code, which is, this is deallocating. And now we are returning because JMPB is the return, you know, the last of the three instructions for returning. So when it returns, Register A has a value, had the value of 0, 0. So we basically look for all the JMPBs, you know, because they are all signifying returning. So we look for J, the next JMPB, okay, right here. And then we look at what A is. It's returning 1, which is correct, because you know, the first one returns 0 squared. This one is 1 squared. So we go for another JMPB right here, and it's returning a 4 this time which is 2 squared, and so on. So I did not you know, track down you know, instruction by instruction, but just by tracking down the quote-unquote landmark you know, events of the trace, I can kind of tell that the program is doing what it's supposed to. Is that okay so far? Now, would, do, do you think 5 is a good test case if you're just implementing this program? What would be a good test case? Zero, <laughs> because in that case, it should not do any recursive call. It should return right away and say, yep, the square of zero is just zero. So if that works, then try one, okay? And if that works, try two. By the time you say that two is returning a four, we're pretty sure the, the program is working, okay? So you, the sequence or how you present the test cases to your program is significant, because if you try the hardest test case first, kind of keeping all your fingers crossed, including your toes, and hope that the, the program is going to work, I can tell you, you will get your muscle cramp, and the program is still not going to work. <laughs> okay? So make sure that you test your program using a certain sequence of test cases. Do the easy ones first, okay? Make sure they all work before you try the harder ones. That was also discussed in... Uh, the second video that I recorded over the weekend for the Traverse program. I specifically said, okay, don't implement even the entire program. Implement a portion of the entire program. Make sure that works first. But when you make sure that works, you also, you know, I also kind of sequence the test cases. Try a null pointer first, okay? Because the null pointer should return right away and go like, I'm not doing anything because I don't have any node to process, okay? And then you try one node where both the L and the R are both zeros. So it's, not, it's going to do recursion, but each recursive call is not going to do a single thing because they just return right away. So it's important to present your test cases 
in a particular sequence. All right, so that's the recursive program that I want to illustrate. Do we have any questions about this particular recursive program? The way it works, the way it's, the way it's coded. I will also kind of you know, bundle this you know, to send it to you after the class. Are we good so far? Okay. So with that out of the way, I can get started. I don't think we can, we can be complete. We can uh, finish you know, the final exam from last semester, but we can get started. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started with that one. Um, let's see, I think I have it already loaded into the tablet, which gives me the ability to kind of point, draw, and annotate. So we'll see, I think it's here. There we go, it is here. All right, can people in the back see the text? Kind of, huh? I can't really blow it up any further. <laughs> but it is being recorded, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I can actually use the uh, PDF too, you know, so let me just use the PDF. <clears throat> I just cannot mark up the PDF here. So in case you don't know where to find the final exam from last semester, it is here. I posted that on the 2nd of May. All right, so this one I can zoom in all I want. There we go. So let's go ahead and zoom in to Nope, that's even worse. Fit page width. There we go. Is that good? All right, cool. Thank you. All right. So just like this one, you have 120 minutes, blah, 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 and so on. So the way the format of the exam is going to be, I give you the C code, okay, all the way to the end. But I also make sure that everything is um, paper clipped. So that means you, know, you can you just take out the last page and then go along with the assembly code as you try to find bugs. All right, so I'm just going to display the C code <clears throat> and we'll check out whether you understand the C code or not. Okay, we'll look at line one, okay, not an issue. That does not exist in assembly code. We look at line three to eight. Does that look familiar to you? Because if it does not, I am very concerned. Because that's what your homework assignment looks like too, sort of. Okay, and then we have you know MP size being five. So now we have this you know add node function. So I know it looks kind of involved, but let's look at one thing at a time. Okay, what is free PP? Can somebody describe the type of the parameter free PP? Okay, you go ahead. Yes. Now, it is multiple layers of pointers, right? But don't let it bother you, okay? Because until we actually use it, you don't have to worry about a single thing. All you have to think is, it is a pointer of some kind. Why do you know, need to know it's a pointer of some kind? Because you need to know how many bytes it's gonna take up on the stack. And every pointer, it's gonna take up exactly one byte in TTP. Now, is it a pointer to a pointer? Maybe. Is it a pointer to a pointer to a pointer? Maybe. Is it just a pointer? Maybe. But they are all just one byte, okay? So from the perspective of the prototype of the function, eh, just knowing that it's a pointer is enough. V is a regular integer, and an update pointer is a pointer to a pointer to a struct n. Once again, we just need to know it is a pointer, okay? So now we move on to the next line. <clears throat> what are we checking on line 13 here? <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Uh, in regards to that free PPP, you're saying that a pointer is just one byte. Does that mean that that is three bytes? Nope, it is. One byte that's going to it is just one byte on the stack. That one byte turns out to be the address of the address of the address of a struct, and then that byte, you know, the, the byte that it's referring to, 
turns out to be the address of a struct node, and then that byte in return is the address of one of a struct node, and then that byte turns out to be the first byte of the struct node. So we've got, so this yeah. This is telling you how many times you have to follow in order to get to an actual struct node. So think of this as in a spy story, okay? You know, somebody gives you an envelope only to get to the location to find another envelope, and inside the envelope is the address to find yet another envelope. So you have to follow three hops to find the actual package that you're supposed to get. Is that okay? I'm pretty sure at the end of this lecture, people just remember Jason Bond. <laughs> and then nothing else. Okay. All right. So what are we checking here? If update pointer, blah, blah, blah. Okay. This is a conditional statement. So once again, when you look at the code like this, it might look very intimidating what is inside here. But for the time being, I just need to know, am I going to go into the land block or am I get into the else block? So what am I actually checking? Hmm? to see whether update pointer itself is null or not, okay? Do we need to know that, but it might point, it may not be null, but what it points to is null. Do we need to be concerned about that? Absolutely not, okay? All we need to know is get the parameter, check whether it is null or not. If it is, go to the else if there's an else. If not, continue with this, okay? So the analysis of this code, <clears throat> the way I would do it, is not to read it sequentially. I would actually skip all the way to where it's supposed to go for the else case and check the structure of the conditional statement to make sure it is valid before I get back to this and go like, okay, so after that, okay, after checking the structure of the code, let's check whether the content of the then branch itself is implemented correctly, okay? But that's just the way I work, okay? You know, I'd like to look at the structure first, and then once the structure is sound, then I go back into whatever is inside the structure and then focus on the, on the detail. Which also means you know, it might help, okay, if you think like that too, it might help to bring you know, colored pencils or pen, um, post-its, you know, little things so you can stick on the paper so that you can remember it's like, okay, that's, that's the beginning of this thing and so on, okay? It might be helpful. Okay, so we look at this one here, okay? Now we have to dereference once, okay, and ask, Okay, update pointer itself is not null, but what it points to is that null, okay? And if that is not null, then we get to here. So we'll focus on line 15 and ask, what do we need to do to get this? So I'm not even looking into the faulty assembly code because I just want to make sure that the C code, you can, we can read the C code and understand what needs to happen first, okay? How it happens in the assembly code is a different question, okay? But we need to know what is supposed to happen. So let's just focus on the highlighted portion here. And I need to look at the time. We still got about seven minutes. Uh, can someone describe the left-hand side of the not equal to? What am I really trying to use for the comparison here? How do we, how do we say it? Say that again. Okay, almost. I think you missed one D reference. Okay, so let me let me describe how I would read this. And this is one thing about C that is not so nice because you, if you try to read from left to right, it doesn't make sense. In order to figure out what you need to do, it helps to read from you know, from the structure perspective. So the very last thing we need to access is member V of a structure that is pointed to by a pointer, okay? Just by reading this much, okay, that's what, tell, what tells me that the final value that we need to get to is the value of member V of a structure that is pointed to by a pointer, okay? So what pointer are we talking about? This whole thing is a pointer. How do we get to that pointer? This pointer, in return, is pointed to by update pointer. So <clears throat> I still need to get back to the tablet because it helps to 
uh, look at a picture of how this will look like in uh, real life. So let me see. Uh, I still have that. It's just hidden here. There we go. Um, let me see if I can. I need to fast forward to the last page. Ah, okay, it won't let me do that, but I'm just going to switch to the last open note and draw the picture over here. All right, so I'm just going to repeat the statement itself or the expression update pointer points to V. Okay, I believe that is the expression. Okay, so how do you, how do we look at this expression here? We know there is a structure of some kind, okay, of which there's a member V, and this structure is pointed to by a pointer. So this much is telling me this portion here. Are we good so far? So what about this pointer here? The pointer to the structure is this portion, which means there's another pointer that points here. Is that okay? So this picture is helpful to some people because you know whenever you see an arrow that goes like this and another arrow that goes like this, they're dereferencing. Okay, all of those are dereferences. Now, there's a certain offset between potentially between the beginning of the structure and the member V, but we'll deal with that later, okay? Because we have to follow the arrows first from here to here and then from here to the beginning of the structure. Once we get to the beginning of the structure, then we know how to find the member V because we should have you know, those you know, uh, values already defined. Are we doing okay so far? And which one do you think is our parameter? Because update pointer is a parameter. So which one is the parameter? Mm, nope. This is our update pointer. So this is our update pointer, which means this one is guaranteed to be on the stack. And the way to get to update pointer is using the stack pointer, add the offset of stack pointer to the stack pointer, update pointer to the stack pointer. Then we have the address of the update pointer, and then we have to do one D reference to get to this thing here. So to get to this thing, we have the usual sequence of instructions, which is LDI with some register, and then we have the name of the function, okay, whatever that is, okay, underscore, update, pointer, that's the offset, that's the address, and we need one D reference. Then B would be the same as this thing here. So these three instructions will accomplish one thing, which is making register B to point to that. Is that okay? All right. So after that, we need another dereference to get to the very beginning of here. But we don't want to dereference because here we need, this is the address already, this part here. Okay, let me point to the screen. This is an address already. This is the address of the beginning of the structure. So whatever the offset to get to member V is, we want to add to this thing. Is that okay so far? So I'm not even talking about TTP ASM instructions. I'm just talking about how do we get to the actual thing, which is the value of a certain member of a structure that is pointed to by a pointer, which in return is pointed to by my parameter of the function called update pointer. Is that okay? All right. So uh, we are going to run out of time. <clears throat> so one thing I want you guys to do, okay, this is something that you can do well ahead of time before Thursday, is this. Okay, so I want you to do what I want you to do is to type this program in and run it in a debugger, run it in a C debugger. In other words, don't even try to write it in assembly code. Run it in the GDB first, 
and make sure that you understand what each line is trying to do. Because understanding that first is going to be helpful to, so that you can translate that into assembly code on Thursday. So this is basically an exercise of you know, um, reinforcing what you learned in CISP 360. Okay, I know they probably do not combine things the way that we, that I do here, but it's really just stacking up you know, one operation on top of another one. We do have a lab today, so let me give you the lab code before you leave here. I'll just write it out because, nope, I, I forgot what it is. So let me go to... Uh, where is it? Recursive calls, that's it, okay. So it is called recursive calls. And then the access code is holodeck. For those of you who are fans of the next generation, you would understand why, but since most of you are born way after you know, that show is off air, I doubt many of you would know the reference. <laughs> Star Trek, the next generation. There's one episode where a, an AI character created a holodeck within a holodeck. So when the crew, quote unquote, exited the holodeck, they just walked into the holodeck created by the AI of the holodeck trying to trick those people and go like, yeah, you think that you're getting back to the ship, but you are not getting back to the ship. <laughs> that was one of the best episodes ever. Well, that's similar to recursion, right? Because you're creating an, another environment that looks kind of the same as the one that you're coming from. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm gonna have to send it to you guys anyway. So, sure. yeah. So which? One? Okay. Yeah, I just want to ask some questions. I was like, you mean the C code or the assembly code? The assembly code. Okay, so let's look. Let's show both of them, and then in the assembly code, where do you want to go? Uh, so for this and statement, mm -hmm. it's to, it's to. Basically, just tell the program that you want oh, to use. Let me, let me stop the recorder first. Okay.